Okay, well, welcome to uh, lecture 15. So this is part one of three of our lecture series on the blood vessels. Okay, so this will follow logically from the work that we just did in lecture 13 and 14 on the heart. Uh, so the upload date for this is going to be on November 11th, 2020. Uh, so I just wanted to do a little bit of review from last class. Um, and in particular, I'm going to look at a few concepts related to, to the heart and some of the electrical activity. Um, and the logic here is that this is something that, that's really important and you're definitely going to see this type of material come up on uh, the midterm on November 19th. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to go over the electrocardiogram um, and emphasize some of the key features. So um, again, you have these various peaks or waves, P, QRS and T. So the P wave is going to represent the atrial depolarization. The QRS peak, as it's called, is going to represent the ventricular depolarization and also the atrial repolarization as well that's hidden within that peak. Um, and then the T wave here is going to represent the ventricular repolarization. So this is always kind of the sequence of events unless there's something that's gone wrong. And so what are the types of things that can go wrong? Well, uh, if you have kind of a normal uh, profile here, you can also have what's referred to as a junctional rhythm. So junctional rhythm is the absence of a, a P wave or P peak. Um, and this is uh, basically where the uh, SA node is not functional or it's not functioning properly. Uh, you have a second degree heart block. I kept calling it a heat block in the last uh, uh, lecture, so I guess I'm still stuck in the lab. Um, uh, and so this is where basically the, the AV node is not uh, conducting electrical impulses from the SA node. And so in this case, you see multiple, uh, uh, multiple uh, P uh, peaks uh, before you see a QRS. So one example of that is here. So multiple P waves before you see the QRS going, okay? And here again, there's a P and there's a P as well. Uh, ventricular fibrillation. And so this is basically where uh, things have gone haywire you see electrical activity all over the place, and this is common when you've had kind of a disastrous incident, like a, a very acute heart attack, or uh, this can also be when uh, you have an electrical shock, for example. Okay, uh, uh, lastly, we focused a lot on, on this diagram here, um, and this is a very important diagram because it brings together kind of all the concepts that we talked about in the heart. Uh, I'm not gonna go over everything, uh, this time, uh, but I've gone over it extensively in the previous lectures, um, and we'll go over it in the uh, in the uh, Q and A section or the um, uh, the live session uh, uh, when when we're at that point. Um, and so, uh, the one thing that I'll just emphasize is that the point of this is to allow you guys to integrate the various concepts that we talked about. And so, the events that are happening with blood flow that we've talked about at length are paralleled by what's happening uh, in terms of the electrical activity and uh, the volume and the pressure changes in the various areas. And so you should be able to, to know kind of what's going on in each of these different uh, phases of, of what we call the cardiac cycle here. Uh, the one thing that I will highlight, um, because it's often confusing for students, is this concept of isovolumetric uh, contraction. So this is basically at the very split second where all the valves are closed and uh, all or most of the blood is in the, the ventricles, okay? Um, and so despite the fact that it's called a contraction, there's actually no um, active squeezing out of the blood at this point, okay? So just be careful. That's just that very split second uh, time that we're, we're thinking about here. Uh, so what are we doing uh, now? Uh, we're gonna focus on the uh, the, the blood vessels. So this material will not be on the exam on November 19th, okay? So it's just the material in the heart that's on the exam from my section, just those two lectures. So this is gonna be a new material uh, that we'll, we'll save for the, uh, the final exam. Uh, so with the blood vessels, of course, we started talking about the heart um, and uh, the blood vessels are obviously gonna connect the heart to the rest of the body. Um, and so you have uh, the arteries, the arteries are bringing oxygen and, and uh, in some cases nutrients to, to the various tissues. And then the, uh, the veins or, or the venous system is bringing uh, the, the blood uh, that is now deoxygenated, rich in carbon dioxide and waste materials back to, to, uh, back to the heart and then ultimately out to the lungs to expel 
that carbon dioxide pick up new oxygen. So today we're going to learn about really kind of the basics of, uh, of blood vessels. It's going to be kind of a lot of definitions today, pretty straightforward. Um, and, uh, and then next time we'll, we'll pick up a little bit more of the, of the physiology. Um, the one that we, we probably won't get to today is uh, the blood flow, blood pressure uh, resistance and peripheral resistance. Uh, sometimes I talk about this a little bit, but I think it'd be better just to keep it in the, in the next lecture as well. Um, and so uh, the relevant chapter here, we're on to chapter 19. Um, and as usual, there, there's lots of great resources out there to, uh, to supplement your knowledge. Um, and so you can check out various YouTube videos as well. Okay, so today is really all about uh, defining uh, the anatomy that we're then going to be working with in the next two lectures. Okay, um, so as I said, let's start by defining the components, then we'll determine how they all work. Uh, blood vessels. Blood vessels is a, a very, very kind of general term. Uh, this includes the arteries, it includes the veins, includes the capillaries. Um, and these things are all emanating from the heart. So we saw that in that kind of big picture diagram that I just showed on the previous page. Um, they work with something called the lymphatic system to circulate fluids. The lymphatic system is something that we'll touch on after we, we talk about blood vessels uh, very quickly. Um, and so you don't need to worry about that right now. Arteries. Arteries are always going to carry blood away from the heart. Okay. Um, and, and this is, they're, they're called arteries if they're carrying blood away from the heart, irrespective of the oxygen status. And so we did learn that there's uh, kind of the, the pulmonary circulation has a few exceptions there. And I talked about that in the very first lecture. Uh, capillaries, capillaries are between the arteries and in, in, in the, the, the veins in terms of the, the system. Um, and so capillaries are, are having direct contact with, with your tissues. And so capillaries are what are responsible for dropping off oxygen, picking up carbon dioxide, for example. Uh, there's other nutrients involved, but, but these are the easiest things to think about, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, the veins, veins are always carrying blood towards the heart. Again, this is irrespective of whether uh, that blood is oxygenated or not. And as we talked about a few seconds ago, uh, just as there are exceptions with the arteries, there are exceptions with the veins in terms of the oxygenation status. And so that definition is always about direction of blood flow. Uh, so, uh, you know, we were just looking at this before. And so, again, you always have the heart. Um, and uh, the heart is, is going to lead to arteries. Arteries will lead to what are called capillaries. And capillaries will lead to veins. Veins are bringing blood, again, always back to the heart. Um, and so what is the proportion of blood that is within each of these structures? And so the main point of this, this pie chart here, is to show you that uh, the veins are actually what contain most of the blood at any one given time. And so the, the, the veins or the venous system are often referred to as storage or capacitance vessels. Um, and this is because they contain about 60% of the total blood at, at any one time, okay? So, so the venous system is really a reservoir for your blood. And so that's what's, what's uh, discussed here. So system, systemic veins supply all of the body except for the lungs, uh, very distensible, uh, partly because they are so distensible, they can store a large amount of blood, okay? So about 60% of that total blood in your body is found within the venous system at any one time. Uh, so whether we're talking about veins, whether we're talking about arteries, um, and even some of the larger capillaries, um, uh, they, they have uh, some uh, similarity uh, uh, between them. Uh, well, actually, I guess, I guess the capillaries we'll think of as, as different here, as, as said by the slide, okay? Um, so there's some similarities between uh, the arteries and, and, and the veins in terms of their, their structures. Um, and so this is, this is based on the fact that they always have kind of three layers. These are called tunics. Um, so tunic means, means covering. It's from, from Latin. Uh, there's the intima. Uh, you can remember that this is on the inside because it's in intimate contact with the blood. There's the media. Media is, is in between. Um, and media basically is made up of, of usually elastic tissues and, and smooth muscle. 
um, and then you have the externa. Externa is the outer layer. Uh, this provides supports for those those blood vessels. Okay, and th th these are found in in veins and in arteries. Uh, not so much in in the vast majority of capillaries, and so I misspoke a little bit earlier. Okay, um, and so this is what we're looking at here. And so uh, as an example here, you have the tunica intima. So you know, again, we look at the structure of these things and, and it's much more complicated than you might, might think originally. So you might think of your arteries or your veins as just these kind of empty tubes, not quite quite the case. Um, and so the, the intima is in contact with the blood uh, and uh, then you have the media, which contains kind of the smooth muscle and the external, which is providing this, this support, okay? Um, and so you see the same structure with the veins uh, it's a little bit less complicated um, than the arteries, but uh, you can see kind of similar layers, okay? Um, as we'll, we'll talk about as we go through here, there's a little bit uh, extra adaptations to the veins. Uh, one example are these valves that you see here that are not present in the arteries, and we're going to talk about those quite a bit towards the end of the lecture. Again, between the arteries and the veins, you have the capillary beds, and so you have these smaller branched uh, arteries which are called arterioles. Arterioles are going to lead to the capillary beds, um, and then you have venules and you have veins, and then you're going back to the heart. So again, keep in mind the direction of flow of the blood. You're always going from the heart to the capillary beds. The capillary beds are always going to be in your tissues or your lungs, and then you're going to the veins and, and back to the heart. Uh, compared to, to the arteries and the veins, um, especially the more complicated ones, the, the capillaries are, are, are very simple structures. Uh, they're smaller. Uh, this is where the sites of gas exchange is occurring. So these are, are, are very kind of simple structures that allow for that gas exchange and exchange of nutrients. Uh, at, at their smallest levels, capillaries can really be just kind of one cell uh, uh, thick um, and just be surrounded on the outer edge here by, by one endothelial cell and, and sometimes Sometimes, but not always, just a basement membrane, okay? So these are, are the very general structures of, of arteries, uh, capillaries, and veins. Again, always remember that direction of blood flow. You're having blood flow down through the artery. Uh, it's going through the capillary bed, and then it's going to go into the veins. Uh, so venules, veins, and then back up to the heart, okay? So that, that flow, we're always going to consider that to be, to be the same. Uh, one thing that I'll point out here is that you have these, these little dots here within the artery, okay? And so you, have, you can see these blue and, and red dots here. There's a yellow one. We'll talk about the yellow one in, uh, in a few lectures. But these are called uh, vasovasorum. What these are are small blood vessels um, that are feeding some of the larger blood vessels. So, so there's muscle in here, right? So uh, in the arteries, there, there's smooth muscle, and this muscle is important for regulating flow of blood. Muscle needs, needs blood, and so uh, some of the larger arteries have their own blood supply, and, and that's what's uh, represented by the, these dots here called the Cugvesa Vesorum. And so these are, in this cross section that we're seeing here, these are basically um, uh, small blood vessels that, that are feeding these larger arteries and veins. So both arteries and veins have the, these structures, okay? Um, and this should remind you a little bit of, of the, uh, the coronary blood supply. And so we talked about how the heart is a muscle, and so it gets its blood first. Um, and, uh, and this is known as the coronary blood supply. It's a very similar concept. And so arteries, they are, they are muscles, and even though they, they deal with, or they have muscle within them. And so even though they deal with, with transporting blood, they also need their own blood supply. And so in this sense, we can think of the vasovasorum as very conceptually similar to the coronary blood supply, okay? Uh, there's different types of arteries and veins. Um, there's, um, for the arteries, we have something called elastic arteries, muscu muscular arteries, and arterioles. Arterioles are always gonna be the smaller one. Uh, similarly, we have veins and venules. Okay, we don't really think of, of multiple types of veins in the same way that we have elastic and, and muscular arteries. And we're going to talk about each of these different categories in a second. This is just a very nice table, 19.1 in the textbook. It, it, it allows you to look at the different kind of composition um, 
of these uh, different vessels. And so you should be able to identify kind of the key differences between them. And so it, it's not too hard. It's a muscular artery. Yep, it has a little bit more muscle. Okay, elastic arteries have a little bit more elastic. And so, so it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, capillaries, again, in the smallest form, they, they have none of these uh, uh, elastic tissues or, or muscles or anything like this. Uh, they're just a very simple structure. We'll talk more about that. Um, and so uh, we're going to, the other thing that this table actually illustrates is the fact that um, although they're made up of the same layers, uh, usually when we talk about veins and arteries, we think about the arteries as having a smaller diameter inside, so an internal diameter where the blood flows relative to its outer area. So it has much more support. Um, and this is in contrast to the, the major veins that have a bigger internal area, so, so a bigger spot for blood to flow. Okay, um, And this makes some sense because we know that arteries are important uh, for carrying blood away from the heart. When the heart contracts, that blood is under high pressure. And so you need kind of this support on the outer walls of the arteries. And so you can see it looks a little bit thicker here um, in, in order to, to um, uh, support that high pressure blood. Um, and so the veins, however, these are um, uh, have this larger internal, internal diameter. And this is important for the role of the venous system in storing blood. Okay, and we talked about that, that about 60% of the blood in the venous system is actually, uh, within the blood system is actually found within the veins. Okay, um, and you can see this if you actually look at a cross section of the uh, arteries and veins. And so what are we looking at here? We're looking at um, what's called a cross section. You have an artery that's beside a, a vein. Okay, um, and just so you know what you're looking at here, basically this is taking a slice through a tissue and you're looking at an artery or a vein head on. Okay, so imagine an artery and a vein running right beside each other and then you cut it um, and then you're looking at it uh, basically from the end. And so the way that that might work is imagine you have an artery or vein going from point A to B. So this is point A, this is point B, and it's going between. And then Basically, what you're doing is you're coming through and you're cutting like this and then looking head on. So what somebody has done is they made a, a tissue sample um, that you can analyze by the, by the microscope. But first, they've cut the tissue like this and then you're looking at it straight on like that. Okay, So we're looking just at this portion here. And so that's why it looks just like a circle. Okay. And in this case, what we're, we're doing is we're looking at a, an artery in a vein that happened to be right beside each other. That's not always going to be the case. But what this illustrates is that relative to the vein, uh, the artery has kind of this, this uh, much thicker outer area. And this much thicker outer area, again, it's going to be really, really important to support um, the high pressure blood that is coming from the heart. Okay, uh, The vein, um, again thinner area on the outside and and relative to you know that ratio of the outer area to the inner area it is different between the two so so you should be able to understand and describe why that is the case okay so what we're going to do now is basically look at a little bit more in depth of each of the structures of those vessels we just talked about so arteries uh, and then we'll go capillaries and then we'll go veins we're doing it in that order because again that's the the flow of blood we're always going arteries uh, uh, capillaries, veins, and then back to the heart. Okay, uh, so arteries, there's actually three types of arteries. There's elastic arteries, uh, there's muscular arteries, and then there's arterioles. Uh, and these basically go from big to small. So the elastic arteries are the biggest ones. The muscular arteries are, are medium or in between, and arterioles, as you might imagine, are, are the smallest ones. Okay, so these are based on size, but they also have different functions. And so I'm not going to just go through and read everything on the slide here. Um, this is information for you guys to know. But the elastic arteries are really kind of the, um, uh, these are the ones that are, are coming right from the heart. So these are the major things like the aorta. Um, and these are called conducting arteries. So they move blood from the heart to the medium-sized vessels. Um, and so these basically uh, have... Uh, a lot of elastic in them. And the reason they have a lot of elastic in them is to be able to 
provide some support for that high pressure blood coming from the heart. Okay, so again, imagine your heart is squeezing out blood at a very high pressure. You need to have a vessel that's able to withstand that in order to to uh, to not cause problems, in order to prevent the, the vessels from breaking. Okay, um, and so so this ability to kind of expand a little bit and to, to uh, provide uh, support for this blood to flow through. Uh, this is also important for, for maintaining a constant blood flow. So uh, that's one function of the elastic arteries that you'll need to know, okay? So it allows continuous blood flow even between heart heartbeats. So even though your heart is contracting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing, these elastic arteries, they're, since they're, they're expanding a little bit and since they, they you know, uh, can accommodate larger amounts of blood, you're able to maintain a constant blood flow from your heart down to the rest of the arteries. Muscular arteries are, are basically most of what we call the named arteries. Um, and so if somebody talks about a, uh, a renal artery or an artery in your liver, you know, these types of things, these are going to be mostly muscular arteries. These are, are usually about the size of, of maybe your pinky down to about a pencil lead. Okay, so a, a big range in sizes there. Um, and obviously they get smaller and smaller as they're going down to the tissues and down to the capillaries. Uh, these are often known as distributing arteries. Um, and this is because they're, they're taking that blood from the elastic arteries that we just talked about. Again, these things coming right off of the heart uh, down to, to the tissues. Okay, uh, I, I mentioned this already, they, they account for most of the named arteries. Um, and, and the key thing with the muscle arteries, not surprising, is that they, they have more muscle. And part of this is because that muscle could help to, to dictate the flow of the blood uh, from uh, one spot to another and it could decide kind of which tissues get the blood at any one time. Okay, and so we, we think about these being active in vasoconstriction so this is constricting artery to, to prevent blood flow if necessary. Arterioles. Arterioles are the smallest arteries. Um, they can contain all three tunics, uh, but uh, the, the structures get more and more simple as you get down towards the ones that, that join up with the capillary beds. And so at some point there, you can imagine there's a little bit of give in terms of is it an arterial or a complex uh, capillary? That doesn't really matter. The point is you're going from big to small. Uh, you're going from uh, the function of being able to, to carry blood to distribute nutrients down at the tissue level. Uh, these are often referred to as resistance arteries. And so they're providing resistance to flow. And so why is that? Well, you're going from a very large diameter starting at the heart and the diameter of those, those vessels of those arteries and ultimately the arterioles are getting smaller and smaller as you're going down to, to the capillary bed. Um, and if you think about, uh, you know, if you, if you had a hose, for example, and the hose uh, is taking water from your tap, if you, for example, um, uh, put your, your thumb over the end of the ho hose, then you're going to have resistance to flow because you're changing that diameter. That's exactly the same thing that's happening here. The, the arteries are, are changing in diameter. They're getting more narrow, and that's going to prevent the liquid from flowing um, in, in the vessel, in this case, blood in the, the arteries and arterioles. Okay, So this provides resistance that really kind of changes the way we think about the way that blood flows throughout the entire system. Okay, And these are going to lead to capillary beds. Again, capillary beds are the site of, of gas exchange. Uh, so just to recap here, uh, we're going from elastic arteries. These are the ones really right beside the heart um, and they can, they can expand to deal with that uh, high pressure of blood that is coming out of the heart. Uh, and then you have the muscular arteries. The muscular arteries are basically all of the named arteries that are uh, taking the blood to the tissues. The arterioles are, are basically going all the way down to the uh, to the capillaries. Okay, so the arterioles are always going to be your smallest uh, arteries. Um, okay, uh, so now we're going to talk about the capillaries. And so again, there's some logic to this. The logic is that blood is flowing through the arteries, through the capillaries, the veins, and then back to the heart. So we're just following the flow of blood through through the uh, through the cardiovascular system here. 
So talking about the capillaries, uh, these things are small and uh, they're smallest. Um, they're so small that really only a single red blood cell can pass through at a time. Um, and so um, red blood cells are the cells that carry oxygen. Um, and you, you'll learn more about those in, in Dr. G's blood lecture. Um, and the, the functions of these are to, so again, function is to carry oxygen. A single red blood cell can pass through a capillary at a time. So these are very, very small vessels. Um, and, uh, you know, some of them have uh, uh, a thin tunica intima. Uh, in the smallest vessels, though, just one cell forms the entire circumference. And so just really kind of a very thin layer of endothelial and sometimes a little bit of basement membrane. Um, they have what are referred to as parasites in some cases. Not all, but some of them have these. These are, are kind of uh, referred to as, as spider-shaped sh stem cells. So stem cells are cells that can basically turn into any other type of cell in the body. But the function of these are to, uh, in this case, are to help stabilize the capillaries. So you can imagine as they get very small, uh, they can be very flimsy. So these cells, these parasites will provide some stability. Um, they also play a role in, in uh, vessel repair. And this is where the ability of stem cells to turn into any other type of cell uh, comes into play. Um, so again, the functions of these guys are uh, related to gas exchange, nutrient exchange, waste, hormones, basically movement of materials into a tissue uh, in both directions. So putting in things that we want and taking out things that we don't want. Uh, there's this term here, interstitial fluid. This relates to the lymphatic system, and we're going to talk about that again in a few lectures. Uh, just like arteries, there's different flavors of, of capillaries. Uh, there's continuous capillaries, uh, fenestrated capillaries, and sinusoidal capillaries. And basically, where when we see these terms, think about uh, permeability. So a continuous capillary, things can't get out of there very easily, but by the time you get down to uh, the sinusoidal capillary, uh, materials can move fairly freely in and out of these, okay? And you'll see that there's, there's different types of, uh, uh, there's different regions where these capillaries are found. Uh, some of them uh, have uh, very important functions within specific tissues. Okay, so we'll, we'll go through these one at a time as well. So first of all, the continuous capillaries. Uh, these are basically most of your capillaries, and so they can be found anywhere. So your skin, muscles, nervous system. And again, some of the key highlights here, this is a single red blood cell, and you can see it's taking up most of the diameter of this vessel. This shows these parasites, so these are these spider-like stem cells that provide support for the capillary structure. Uh, they're also involved in vessel repair. Now, one thing that's that's very important to note is that um, you have these uh, endothelial cells that are together, and um, they're joined by what we refer to as a tight junction. Um, and so, depending on the number of these tight junctions, that really defines the permeability of these continuous capillaries. And so, in some cases, the cells are very flush together, like this, and in other cases, there's, there's little gaps between the cells. And this will allow uh, materials like gas and nutrients to enter and to leave the capillaries um, in different locations, in different uh, tissues, okay? So these are, are kind of most of the capillaries in your system. Again, uh, very small, very narrow, single red blood cell in diameter. Uh, you then have what are called fenestrated capillaries. And so this is just the next level of permeability. Um, and so some key features here, you can start to see that you, these are kind of have less tight um, junctions. And so those cells are kind of pulling a little bit further apart. There's bigger gaps and there's more of them. In addition, there's these little essentially holes within these endothelial cells that can again, allow more uh, solutes, gases, uh, nutrients, wastes, whatever, uh, move in and out of these vessels. And these are called fenestrations. And so fenestrations comes from a, a Latin word called fenestra, which is um, uh, 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 fenestra is, is the Latin word for, for window. Okay, so these are small windows where solutes can move in and out of the capillaries.
Okay, um, and so so uh, again, this is the 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 kind of the next stage. They are more permeable, um, and these are found in areas of high filtration, such as the the kidney or the gut. And so it kind of makes sense that you have a lot of these in the gut. This means like your your intestines where you're absorbing nutrients because you have a lot of uh, solute fl uh, flow in and out. Okay, so a lot of nutrients that might be bigger than the gases that that are normally trans in and out in the continuous capillaries, okay? So uh, continuous, uh, fenestrated, and there's one more style, which is called sinusoidal. So again, here uh, you can see the structure of the capillary is really kind of breaking down. It's very loose. You have really kind of large gaps, large intercellular clefts between the endothelial cells. Um, again, still very narrow. You have a you know, basically the diameter of a red blood cell may be a little bit bigger, but you have these really kind of very big um, sinuses or, or large holes within the uh, within the uh, endothelial membrane, um, and so everything is kind of really incomplete. You do have some tight junctions, but but not too many, just enough to maintain that kind of overall architecture. Um, and so the functions of these are basically, um, well, first of all, you find these mostly in areas like the liver, the bone marrow, parts of the kidney. And really, the, these holes are so big that there's, there's cells, mostly cells that are involved in your immune system, such as macrophages, that can basically reach in and grab out things like bacteria that shouldn't be within your, your blood supply. Okay, So that's one function of those sinusoidal capillaries. They can be involved in the immune function. Uh, immune cells can reach in with uh, extensions um, and basically go in and, and grab out things that shouldn't be there. So those are the three types of capillaries. Again, continuous capillaries, these are the least permeable. Then you have the medium uh, permeable, which are the fenestrated ones. Again, remember the Latin word uh, for window. And then sinusoidal capillaries, these are the most permeable. So permeable that you can get cells that actually reach in there grab things out that shouldn't be in there and, and dispose of them. Okay, um, so capillary beds are where arterioles and venules meet. Um, and so uh, one thing that I want you to know is that that these are, are, are not just uh, kind of bystanders within the blood flow process. There is active regulation in what flows in and out of these capillary beds. And so we talked about the arteries. Um, we talked about arterioles. These are going to be the smallest branches of the arteries, and then you have the capillary beds. So this is what we just talked about, these capillaries, okay? So this could be um, a continuous capillary bed, for example. Um, and one thing that's important to, to think about is that um, depending on the constriction, both here and here, this will really kind of determine the flow through these capillary beds, okay? Um, and so um, as you, you clamp down in these regions, here and here, this basically pinches off and prevents blow, uh, blood from flowing through those areas. And so if we take our straw again here, it's like pinching it like this. You're going to prevent the flow from here out. Okay. Um, a few other features of these capillary beds. Um, sometimes you have uh, what's called a vascular shunt. And so this is uh, basically a, uh, a connection right through from the arterial to the venule where blood can flow uh, directly if needed, okay? And control through this vascular shunt is actually controlled by what are called pre-capillary sphincters. And so when these clamp down, these are going to prevent um, uh, flow into the actual capillary bed and you're going to get direct flow from the arterial all the way to the venule, okay? And so, um, and, and again, we're gonna talk about venules in a second in veins. Um, and again, this, this is gonna dictate kind of how much uh, uh, blood flow you have into the individual tissues. And so if this is a tissue out here in this region, then if this vascular shunt is, is active or is, is, is clamped down here and you're not getting blood flow into this capillary bed, then you're not gonna be getting gas exchange with these regions. Okay. Uh, one thing to note is that um, uh, when you have these precapillary sphincters, um, these basically these are made of smooth muscle, but there's no nerves going into these regions. They are controlled strictly by by the local chemical 
compounds that are, are within this area. And so the local chemicals, and we'll see that, that things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, things like this, this will determine whether the capillary bed is open or closed. This just shows a little bit of a, a, of a different diagram if you had uh, trouble visualizing that. And so again, these pre-capillary sphincters, if they're active, they, you'll get blood flow directly through this uh, vascular shunt and you will uh, prevent uh, uh, the blood from flowing into the larger capillary bed, okay? Um, okay, so we talked about the arteries, we talked about capillaries, now we're just gonna briefly talk about the, about the veins. Um, veins, again, we talked about structure a little bit already. The, the, the main thing that I want you to remember is that these are capacitance vessels. Um, they've got all those tunics, but they have those thinner walls, okay? So the reason that, that you have these thinner walls is because the blood is under low pressure in this system, okay? Um, and, and these thinner walls that are a little bit distendable um, and these large lumen, so lumen means the interior area of the vessel, and this allows the veins to store a large amount of blood. And we said that they have up to 60 or 65% of, of the blood supply. So these are capacitance vessels. This means that they're blood reservoirs. Uh, so just like we had arteries and veins, we have veins and venules. Uh, basically, uh, the as you're moving out of the capillary bed, the capillaries are going to get larger and larger and larger. You're going to start to get a little bit of structure to them, and, and eventually we refer to them as, as venules. The venules will join up to form larger veins, and those veins will carry a blood back to the heart to be pumped out to the lungs and pick up a new round of oxygen, okay? Um, so veins, veins are low pressure systems. Uh, because they're low pressure systems, um, there's a few adaptations that ensures that blood is able to return to the heart after it's going through the capillary beds. This isn't really a concern for the arteries because the arteries are, are right after the heart. The heart is contracted, that blood is going, it's going fast. You don't need to regulate um, a flow in a single direction. Just the pressure of the contraction of the heart is ensuring the blood is flowing in, in the proper direction when we're talking about arteries and arterioles. But once you go through the capillary bed, uh, pressure drops, uh, and if you want to get that blood back to the heart, if you want it to go in the right direction, then you need a few adaptations to allow that to happen. Um, and uh, so there's a few of these things. First of all, um, as we talked about, there's a, a large diameter uh, of the lumen. So this is the interior area. There's not a lot of resistance to flow, okay? Um, so even low pressure can, can move liquid through those veins. There's also something called uh, uh, valves. So venous valves will prevent the backward flow of blood. Um, and so you see this structure here. Um, and so these valves will, will, will basically be pushed open um, as blood flows through them, and then they're gonna close. Um, and when they close, blood cannot flow back into the other, in the other direction. And so these actually remind me quite a lot of the, the semilunar valves in the heart. And so, you know, just, I talked about kind of these, these doors of the, of the saloon, they're, they're breaking open like this. And then once you go through, you, you can't go out. Okay. And so, uh, as, as slowly as the blood might move through the veins, once it goes through these valves, it's not going back in the other direction. Uh, there's one other adaptation that can help, uh, uh blood flow through veins despite the fact that it's under low pressure. And this is the, the, the presence of skeletal muscle around the veins, okay? And so basically, as you move, as you work out, as you get up and walk around, those skeletal muscles are gonna put pressure on the veins and move the blood in a single direction. Part of the reason it moves in a single direction is because once it goes through one of these valves, it's not going back in the other direction, okay? So three things that help the blood flow is the large diameter of the veins, the fact that you have these valves, and uh, the action of skeletal muscle, okay? So again, getting up, moving around, this can help blood flow back to your heart. Um, and when that doesn't happen properly, uh, you can get something called varicose veins. And so if you have these valves that don't work properly, for example, um, then you can get blood that, that doesn't make its way back uh, 
to the heart from a particular tissue. And so you get veins which are, are, which are enlarged and distended because those valves are not working properly. And so you may have heard of varicose veins. These are something that are impacted by heredity, but also by, uh, by environmental or, or uh, factors or, or things that we do every day in our life. So for example, uh, uh, prolonged standing, obesity, uh, pregnancy, um, this will all exacerbate or contribute to the uh, appearance of varicose veins. And so this should make sense because I just talked about the fact that you have that skeletal muscle that helps to promote the return of blood to the heart. Um, okay, um, so one other example of varicose veins is uh, um, in the abdominal area or in the anal area are, are hemorrhoids, okay? And so this actually occurs because of increased pressure uh, that can occur in this area. So varicose veins occur when you have these, these leaky valves, blood is not moving out of the tissue properly. It will pool and again, moving around, this can help prevent varicose veins or, um, or alleviate some of the conditions that result because of them. Um, okay, and so this is just what, what varicose veins look like. Um, and so again, the valves are, are not working properly and so blood is going to pool and you can get the stension of these veins and, and you know, you, you may have seen these. These are, are veins which will kind of uh, pop out of the skin. Um, again, as you move, as you, you work out, as you, you, you uh, do physical activity, it can prevent this type of thing uh, from occurring. Okay, um, one other thing that I just wanted to mention are these things that um, uh, in your, your blood supply that are called anastomoses. And you've heard this word before and we'll point it out again. Um, and so anastomoses are basically uh, uh, referred to very generally as interconnections of blood vessels. And so uh, basically this, these are um, interweaving blood vessels that basically allow blood to flow if one area is blocked, okay? So if you have a, a blockage in one area, anastomoses or branched channels, if you will, will provide alternate routes for that blood to flow, okay? And so you have these in both your arterial system and your venous system. Um, in your venous system, they're, they're, they're all over the place, and so you rarely have this kind of blocked flow. And so even if you have these kind of varicose veins, what happens is that, that there are other channels that can take blood um, and, and move it back to where it needs to go. And so we did hear about anastomoses previously. These are these kind of, uh, kind of network of blood vessels that provide alternative routes. And so if you have a blockage here, you can have a blood go a different direction to get to where it needs to go. Okay, so anastomoses are important in the heart, but they're also important in other areas of the body as well. So you can just think of anastomoses as branches or junctions that are alternative routes for blood to flow. We talked previously about how in the heart, this is important to prevent those, those coronary heart attacks. Um, okay, so um, again, just emphasizing that in the venous system, they're so abundant that, that veins really very rarely have blocked flow. Um, again, you might have uh, some of these varicose veins, but that's not enough to prevent flow back to the heart, uh, and this is because you have these anastomoses. Okay, so so that, that is it for this lecture. There are, um, again, some more review questions, and I'll post the answers to these as I did previously for the heart section. Okay, so please take a look at those, and any questions that you have, we can take up after the fact. Um, so there's a number of them today. Um, so summary today, this was really kind of all about definitions, really kind of laying the groundwork with, with some anatomy so that we can then learn about the physiology. So a little bit more into the structure function next week. As always, if you have questions, uh, just shoot me a quick email or you can ask during the live session on Monday. So uh, thank you very much um, and, uh, and I will see you next time.